Good morning. Welcome to our January session of the Winter Circle. We are fired up to start the new year of our leadership sessions. It's always good to bring clarity to what we do. We bring in the best and brightest from our community and beyond to share with us just what it takes to succeed in classroom, uh, extracurricular activities, and in life itself. So we need to come with a curious mindset, sit up straight, think about great questions we can ask in our Q&A. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to say a special thank you to Mrs. St. Pierre for bringing in and connecting us with our speaker today. So it's with that and tradition of the Winter Circle, I'd like to introduce Gretchen and Ellie to introduce our speaker. <laughs> Mr. Jason Andreas grew up on a large farm in a small town in Ohio. Due for his love of milk, he grew healthy 6'10", helping him land a scholarship to play basketball for Coach Tom Izzo at Michigan State University. After a national championship, two Final Fours, a handful of Big Ten championships, and a team captainship his senior year, he went on and played professional basketball in Europe. Jason has now worked for Google for over 12 years, tinkering with law school and also earning an MBA along the way. He enjoys art, music, travel, sports, and spending time with his family. He has a wife, two daughters, and two dogs. Let's give Mr. Andreas a warm East Hills welcome. Nicely done. <laughs> Good introduction. Thank you, guys. Gretchen and Ellie? Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if you guys saw, but they're both wearing Michigan State gear, which uh, definitely gives uh, extra bonus points to both of them. Um, thank you for the introduction. I think you covered pretty much everything I was going to talk about, so I don't really know what else to go into. So, any questions? No, I'm joking. I've got a few things that we'll cover today, but thank you very much, girls. I really appreciate it. And thank you guys for getting up a little bit early this morning to come in. I know you guys do this often, but it means a lot. Uh, and hopefully I can teach you guys and, uh, a few things today and talk you through a couple stories along the way, and we'll have a good time this morning. So, as Gretchen and Ellie said, uh, my name's Jason Andreas. Um, I, I brought some visuals uh, for you guys today. I feel like discussions like this are always a little bit more fun with visuals. Um, as uh, the girls were mentioning, I actually didn't grow up in Michigan. I'm not a Michigander uh, by birth. I actually grew up in the state of Ohio. Uh, so that, that south, the state south of us that uh, many dislike is actually not the worst place in the world. This is actually my family farm that I grew up on. Uh, it's a dairy farm uh, and we raise Holstein cows. We had about 3,000 cows on this farm. Um, my house is actually right there in the trees over there, and my dad actually grew up here. So a very quaint little town, a very small little town. Um, 3,000 cows. The town is actually called Sugar Creek, Ohio, and there was about 1,500 people that grew up there uh, or were living there at any given time. So there was more cows on my farm than people in the town that I grew up in. So a very small place to grow up. Um, somehow, I was found in that tiny little town. Uh, and was fortunate enough to go on to play basketball uh, for Coach Izzo here. This is Coach Izzo many, many years ago. Uh, much darker hair than he has now, much fewer wrinkles. Uh, this is actually the, the day we won the national championship, and you can kind of spot me hiding here behind the, the national championship trophy. Um, so I played for Coach Izzo, uh, Hall of Fame coach, um, as the girls mentioned. A lot of success. I was very fortunate to be there from uh, 1999 to 2004. We, of course, won a national championship, uh, two Big Ten championships, went to two Final Fours, uh, one in Indianapolis, one in Minneapolis. Uh, I was team captain my senior year, voted on by my peers. Uh, and also, probably the most important thing here that we're in a school, uh, I was a four-time academic All-Big Ten nominee as well. So uh, the first, actually, in Michigan State basketball history. Uh, after I graduated from Michigan State, I was fortunate enough to go on and play professional basketball. I played in Europe. Uh, pop quiz, anyone know what flag this is? Just shout it out. I heard it, I heard it from these guys already up here. Uh, Sweden, so my first year I played in, in the great country of Sweden. Um, Portugal. Portugal, not bad, we got some good ones here. Ooh, Finland, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I was able to play three years overseas, fantastic, got to travel, explore the world. Uh, and made a little bit of money while doing it as well. But of course, uh, everything must come to an end and I had to actually get a, an actual real job. Um, and I came back to the United States, this was about 2007, um, and like many people, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I just got done playing basketball. Pretty much basketball was my life for about 25 years. Um, but I heard of this little company called Google and it sounded pretty cool. Um, 
I think most impressively, they gave you free food and they let you bring dogs to work. And I was like, well, that sounds like a pretty cool place. Uh, throw my application there. And uh, I've actually been working there for about 12 and a half years. These are some pictures. You've probably heard some things about Google. It's a pretty cool place to work. Um, these are some of the offices that I visited around the world. Um, this one's a lot of fun, as you can see. That's in Switzerland. Um, and uh, a really great place to work. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll, I'll, I'll go into some details here. And uh, wanted to kind of talk about, I suppose, from my perspective, uh, four or five things that I think help you kind of succeed, things that I've learned along the way, both growing up on a farm, playing basketball at a place like Michigan State, playing basketball overseas, and then working at a great company like Google. Uh, a couple of things that have helped me succeed, and I think that you guys can hopefully take some of these things, at least one or two of them, and apply them to some of the things that you guys are doing, whether it be school, uh, whether it be hobbies like art or music, whether it be athletics. Um, hopefully you can take some of these along with you and apply them to the things that you're doing to help you either succeed more or find a way to succeed in the things that maybe you're struggling with as well. I narrow these things down to what I call the four Ps. This is my humor for the day, huh? not bad. Um, so the five Ps, uh, the first one we'll start with, the first P, prioritization. So can someone, we'll do raise of hands here, can someone tell me what it means to prioritize? Sure. Like things that are most important to things that are not as important. Perfect. I couldn't have said it any better myself. Um, here's kind of something that, that I look at on a daily basis. So are you spending the most time? with the opportunities that will meaningfully lead to success and for you to win, something that we always focus on. And again, you can apply this to pretty much anything that you guys are doing. Uh, here's just a picture of our team here. I think this was actually in the national championship game, and somehow I got my name in the picture there, so I like that one. Um, some stories about prioritization that I think are really interesting. So um, when I got to Michigan State, I was 18 years old. Actually, I was 17 years old. I hadn't quite turned 18. I was very young for my, for my class. Um, our first meeting, we met with Coach Izzo, and we were obviously quite nervous, and he said, I want to tell you a, a little bit about what it's going to be like to play basketball at Michigan State, uh, and this lesson was on prioritization. He basically said, as a student athlete here at Michigan State, you have the opportunity to focus on three things. You can be an athlete, you can be a student, or you can focus on social life. That's a pretty easy uh, choice for most students because most students don't play sports, right? So they choose academics and social life. So they study, they take tests, they go to their classes, and they have a fun time hanging out with their friends on the side. Of course, what he's trying to lead us into is that uh, if we were to choose, let's say, social life and academics, well, of course, we're not choosing basketball, we're not choosing athletics, and our basketball life starts to slip. Potentially, we lose our scholarship and we're not playing anymore. You lose your, your academics, you lose your social life anyhow. If you choose academics and social life, uh, oh, excuse me, basketball and social life, your academics slip. If your academics slip to a certain point, again, you lose your scholarship and you're no longer playing basketball, you're no longer in school anymore. So what he was basically doing was showing us uh, in so many words that you kind of have to prioritize the things that are going to be most important for you guys. For us, it was basketball and academics. We really didn't have a whole lot of time to hang out with our friends and socialize. And that's one of the things you have to do. You have to sacrifice sometimes when you prioritize, as you were mentioning, what's most important to what's least important. We were there to play basketball, to get a, to get a, um, to get a diploma, to graduate. And those were the two things that we focused on. So sometimes prioritization means sacrifice, but that's OK as long as you're passionate about the two things that you're prioritizing over the others. Does that make sense? Cool. The second P. Proactivity. We have somebody else. What's it mean to be proactive? Anyone? We'll throw it back to the front again. So, proactivity, it's like something you really push yourself in that you strive to be really good at. Yeah, sure. That's not bad at all. So, are you thinking ahead? Are you anticipating and looking around the corner? So, are you really focusing on being good at one particular thing? Are you being proactive versus reactive? or being lazy at certain things, right? Um, I don't know exactly what's happening in this picture, but I think this is Coach Izzo telling me that I need to be more proactive. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Um, time will tell, I suppose. Um, a story about proactivity, I, I'll use a lot of examples from my time at Michigan State. Um, I remember very vividly, that it was, the, the date was April 4th, 2000. I don't think any of you were born yet here in the audience. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is a bit scary to think about. Um, it was the day after we had won the national championship uh, in Indianapolis. And uh, we had been out celebrating all night the night before. We had hopped on the team airplane to fly home the next morning. And most of the, the players, our cheerleaders, the band, everyone that was on the plane with us, we were still celebrating. We were talking about what we were going to do when we got back to East Lansing. And I remember looking at the back of the plane where the coaches sat, and Coach Izzo and his entire staff weren't really reveling in the win like most of us were. They, of course, were happy that we had just won probably the biggest game of all of our careers. They were actually sitting there talking about what we were going to be doing for summer workouts, what players were going to be doing what, how, how uh, students' grades were, uh, what recruits they were looking at for the next season. So literally, we're 24 hours after the biggest game of any of our careers, and the coaching staff is already thinking proactively about what next season looks like. This is what leads to success, right? Not necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily bad to celebrate and enjoy successes, but those folks that are truly successful in life, they're always looking for what's next. They're always proactively looking to what they can do next to make themselves better. Um, proactivity is also about anticipation a little bit as well. So kind of shifting gears a little bit to my time at Google. One thing that we do, we, uh, in, in my role, I can talk about it a little bit later, maybe in the Q&A, but in the role that I have at Google, I meet a lot with customers. Um, and uh, when we meet with these customers, we spend a lot of time of, of uh, proactively kind of thinking about not just what we're going to talk to them about, what type of Google products we want to talk to our customers about, but we try and proactively understand what, might, what questions might they ask us, right? What might they be interested in? Um, what concerns might they have in the conversation that we're having? Uh, and being proactive in doing something like that allows us to be prepared, right? So when we go into these meetings, if we've thought of the 20 or 30 questions that they may ask us, concerns that they may have, when they ask those questions, it's almost like a light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, I've already thought about this. I've already proactively prepared what's going on here. And it's really easy to answer those questions very confidently. For you guys, maybe it's like taking a test, right? If you're proactive in preparing for a test, when you start reading that first question, that second question, isn't it such a good feeling when you can kind of that light bulb goes off for you as well? And you're like, I know all the answers to these. This is really easy. And there's a big weight of relief that comes to you on the opposite side. If you haven't proactively prepared and you don't know those, that's when panic sets in and you typically don't do a great job. So the more proactive you can be, usually the more success that you can find. Again, this is applied to school, sports, art, anything that it might be. The third P, halfway through, perseverance. Anyone know what perseverance means or what it means to persevere? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what it is. It's spot on. So having heart hustle, being relentless in pursuit of your goals, even when things are hard. Um, perseverance also is, you know, if you have a specific goal, if there's something that you're interested in, really persevering it and, and, and focusing on that particular goal as much as you possibly can and going at it with 100% effort that you possibly can. Um, when I was in high school, again, I showed you guys the farm that I grew up on, really in the middle of nowhere. There's, there's not a whole lot around there. Um, I was recruited to play at Michigan State. I wasn't a top 100 recruit in the country. That's fairly important because a lot of the big programs like Michigan State and Duke and Michigan, uh, UCLA, they usually look at the top 100, 100 recruits and that's the type of folks that they look at spending time trying to get to come into their program. I was just outside of that, uh, maybe a 120, 130 in my particular class. But I was still recruited really heavily by Michigan State and I remember Coach Izzo sat down with me one time. I think I was 15 or 16 years old, so not a whole lot older than you guys. Uh, and I was being recruited pretty proactively. And he said, Jason, do you know why we're recruiting you? And of course, I was like, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty tall, right? I'm, I'm pretty strong at the time. I was a pretty good basketball player. Both my dad and my uncle played basketball at Ohio State. Um, and I thought there was some lineage there. And he said, that's all great, but that's not what it is. He said, when we watch you play, from the minute you step on the court to the minute you step off the court, you give 100%. You're a great teammate. Uh, you persevere no matter what. Even if your team's losing to the very last minute on the clock, you play very hard. Uh, see, what I found out was that when Coach Izzo would come to recruit at my games, and I played on a very good team, a lot of players on my team went on to play professional basketball for many, many years. What he would do is he would actually arrive to the game about 30 minutes early, and he would watch us stretch and warm up and see how we would interact with the crowd, how we would interact with our teammates. 
He would also stay to the very end of the game where a lot of other college coaches that maybe were there recruiting would leave at halftime to go get a flight home or to take a look at a different player. He would stay there the whole time and watch from start to finish. How did you persevere? How did you pursue your love for the game of basketball? And it's very important for him. And that's why he, a lot of people will ask, how does Coach Izzo continue to recruit really great players? That's what he does. He really looks at those players who persevere and are always very interested in achieving their goals. My goal was to play Division I basketball in the Big Ten. Um, and really, there was nothing that would stop me from achieving that. And that meant hustling, stretching as hard as I could, interacting with my teammates, focusing on the game of basketball. That's what I did. And they caught that throughout the process. The fourth, preparation. This is a pretty easy one. Anyone? Preparation? Um, it's basically um, like practicing or maybe, I don't know. Spot on. You got it. Keep going with it. Um, basically like our um, practicing for something. You're trying to get better for it, like waiting, like waiting for a game or yeah. getting ready for it. Nailed it. Yep. Absolutely. So making the time to fully prepare, right, and to anticipate. So ensuring you show up your best every single day. Can anyone uh, guess what happens uh, at Michigan State if you were late to practice? Sure. Um, Skip. Sure. We'll go over here. You get benched. Benched. Yeah. You're like not as ready, and you don't play your best because yeah. you're not warmed up and yeah. ready to play. Sure. Coach yells at you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually, those are probably all right, but it's actually a trick question. Um, in my five years at Michigan State, um, I did some quick math last night, and, and I roughly determined it was about a thousand practices that I participated in. Uh, and each year we had about 15 or 16 teammates, roughly. Um, in five years, believe it or not, not one person was ever late for practice, right? So we never found out what happened. First of all, I think because we were terrified <laughs> as to what it would have been, but also because uh, we were taught very early when we arrived at Michigan State that uh, preparation is absolutely key, right? Being prepared, uh, making sure that you're warmed up, making sure your body's ready to go is, is key. See, at Michigan State, um, I'm sorry? It's like practicing for a test. Absolutely. It's like practicing for a test, if, yeah. If you don't, then you might fail. Yeah, absolutely. And the same thing applies to, to academics as it does to sports. Uh, we usually practice around 3 o'clock every afternoon after we had gone to classes for the day. And if practice started at 3 o'clock, we were expected to be there probably about 60 minutes early. So we're not just rolling in at 2.55, throwing our shoes on and going onto the court. We'd get there about an hour early. We would make sure that we were stretched. We'd make sure that our ankles were taped if we had any rehabilitation on any nagging injuries. We took care of those. We would get up into the gym, get some shots up, break a sweat so that when Coach Izzo rolled out, roughly right at 3 o'clock, he blew the whistle and practice started full speed 100%. We were ready to go, right? Just like the preparation for a test. When that test hits your desk, you should be ready to go, not just waking up, getting ready, starting to think about what that test is about. Again, the preparation is for the game, for the test. So this is important. So when we actually got onto the court to play against, I think this is Kentucky we were playing against. Um, Kentucky is a very good team. If we were to get there and the game starts, the ball goes up, and the ball is tipped. Five, ten minutes into the game, we're just starting to get warmed up, ready to play. We'd be down by 20, 30 points. You need to be ready to go the minute the ball's tipped, and that's why that type of preparation is incredibly important as you get ready to play, to practice, to take tests, things of that nature. The last P, performance. That's a pretty easy one. Anyone, anyone else? Performance, what's it mean to perform? Um, like, so, like your best the good thing that you're really good at? Absolutely, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So how did you do? How, did you set out to do what you wanted to do? What, are you the best at what you participated in, what you prepared for, what you persevered, right? Um, so each year at Michigan State, uh, we typically would lead the entire country in rebounding, which means we got more rebounds by a long shot than most of the teams we played against. Um, we would practice incredibly hard. We ran a drill called the war drill, which uh, essentially was a rebounding drill that was much tougher than anything that would, we would encounter in an actual game. In fact, if you did the things we did in that drill, you'd get fouls immediately from the referees and probably tossed out of the game. 
Um, but the purpose was to make the practices much harder than the performance, right? So as you prepared for these things, the last P or pre uh, preparation, as you prepared to play in these games, essentially what happens is if you're, if you're practicing and preparing at a much higher level, when you actually get to the game, the, the performance seems to be easy. That's the enjoyable part, right? The same thing for meetings, right? When I'm working at Google, the more that I prepare, when I get to the performance, when I actually have meetings with customers, that should be the enjoyable part. Um, another thing that we learn at Google actually too, which is really interesting, is that performance doesn't always have to be positive, right? It, we learn at Google that it's actually okay and sometimes encouraged to fail. Uh, the important thing though is if you're failing, that you're learning from it and changing what you learn very quickly into a positive. Um, as an example, uh, if you are encouraged not to fail, uh, what typically happens, right? You're gonna go out there and you're gonna probably take the path of least resistance. You're gonna try and take it easy, right? You're gonna probably do a good job, but maybe not really push yourself to be the absolute best that you can. Whereas if you're encouraged to fail, uh, or to learn from your fail failure and, and you feel comfortable with that, you might go out there and say, all right, well listen, if, I'm, if it's okay that I fail, uh, I'm probably gonna maybe try a little bit harder, maybe take some risks that maybe I wouldn't have taken, and sometimes that's when you reach that top of the performance. So really what's important is taking account for what you're doing, what your performance looks like. Did you prepare properly? If you did, why did you succeed? If not, what led to that lack of success in the performance as well? So, the five P's. Can you remember all of them? Prioritization, proactivity, perseverance, preparation, and performance. And I think I mentioned at the beginning, um, these are all, a lot of the examples that I shared with you guys are from basketball, from work at Google, of course, uh, things of that nature. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of these things can be applied to things that you guys are interested in as well. Obviously, we're here at school, so right, your schoolwork, preparing for tests, uh, prioritizing what's important to you guys. Um, but it can be applied to things like music, right? If you guys are interested in music, if you're interested in art, different hobbies that you guys have outside of school as well, even your social life, these things can be applied to making sure that once you get to that performance P, the last one, that you're really ready to go, that everything has been anticipated, and that you're, you feel that the performance is everything that you expected it to be. Um, that's it. Cool. Um, just wanted to give you those five P's so you guys can think about those and apply them. Again, like I said, if you can focus on one of them, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I think we've got five or ten minutes left, so maybe we can jump into a couple questions. Sure. How, how did you adjust going from playing basketball with not a very big social life and then being, at, um, being a worker at Google and having, like, having to do a ton of socialization. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, yeah. If you guys didn't hear the question, so it was, how did you adjust from, uh, like I mentioned earlier, basically 25 years of, of playing basketball. Uh, the thing that I mentioned in terms of prioritization at Michigan State where uh, my focus was uh, prioritized on academics and athletics and not social life, how do you then go into a job, like a job at Google, where it's very social, you're absolutely right. Um, it's tough, right? It, it is a tough transition to go from something that you've done for so long into something new, and it's very scary if you graduate from, from college or whatever it might be to go into the working world. But what I tried to do is bridge that gap with things that I knew. So basketball had always made me a very competitive person. So I was always finding ways to compete with myself, to set goals for myself that I could then try and achieve. So when I moved on from basketball and started working at Google, I took some of that competitive spirit with me, right? Um, I got into basically the world of sales. Sales can be very competitive by nature, right? You set goals, you try and achieve them, you try and say, I'm gonna sell so many things this month, next month I'm gonna try and improve upon that. So I took that competitive spirit and moved that into the working world, and then I'm a pretty social guy by nature, so that was pretty easy for me to layer on top of that, but I took something that I knew and that competitive spirit, uh, I put that into the working space, and then the social stuff kind of started to naturally roll on top of that. Any questions? Sure. Why did you want to um, work at Google after basketball? Yeah. Well, the question is, why did I want to work at Google after basketball? Um, I mentioned a few things just a minute ago, right? Uh, just the, the competitive nature of kind of the world of sales. I, I joked a little bit in the presentation about 
uh, free food and being able to bring dogs to work. Um, but that was definitely a draw as well. Um, and it just seemed like a really fun and interesting company, right? Um, a company that was doing some really interesting things at the time, um, helping people find things that they're looking for. Does everyone in here use Google mostly on a daily basis? Everybody. Yeah, right. And what's interesting about Google too is Google is not just Google.com, right? Does, did, did anyone in here know that Google owns YouTube? Does anyone know that? No. Yeah. So do you guys watch YouTube? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we own Google Maps, Gmail. If you guys don't have an iPhone, you have an Android phone potentially. So Google owns Android. So a lot of you probably have Google-based phones as well. Um, so I really thought that it was a really interesting company that was doing a lot of really cool things to help people out on a daily basis. Um, and so that's really what drew me to it as well. Sure. Does Google own Grammarly? Does Grammarly? Yeah. No, we don't own Grammarly. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say every every time I go on my Chromebook, it always pops up. Get Grammarly. Get Grammarly. Yeah. So we do own Chromebooks though. So we Chromebook and, and Google Chrome as a browser obviously is owned by Google as well. So good plug. Thank you. Sure. How do you balance your academic life and basketball? The question is how do you balance academic life? and athletic life. So basketball for me, but it could be sports for, for all of the rest of you. Just you raise a hand uh, who here plays sports. Holy cow. Wow, all of you. OK, that's good. Most of you. Maybe there's a few that I don't see. But um, it's, it's tough, right? That's always a challenge, right? Um, but I uh, kind of the, the world that I grew up in, uh, and this was kind of a, a, um, kind of a guidance from my mom and dad was that academics always come first. Uh, you guys are in a school ecosystem, and I kind of implied this earlier uh, at Michigan State as well. Um, one thing about being here um, at East Hills, going into high school, if your academics aren't up to speed, the rest doesn't matter, right? If you're not getting, making the grades, you're not gonna be able to play basketball or whatever sport anyhow, you're gonna be struggling with school, right? When you get to college and you have a scholarship, you have to m maintain a certain grade point average as well, so a certain level of grades. If you're not maintaining that grade point average, you actually lose your scholarship and then you're not able to play sports any longer anyhow. So in terms of balancing it, I would say you almost always have to focus on academics first and ac athletics second. But of course, when you're playing sports, you want to be able also to be able to be good at both. So if you can, if you can give the priority to, bas or to, to sports, or excuse me, <laughs> the priority to academics, and then whatever's left over with the time, you know, you, you have to determine, again, what, what do you want to prioritize? Is the rest of your time for sports and, and, and working on your craft there? Is it spending time with friends and family? You really have to determine that for yourself because everyone's a little bit different. But academics really have to be the key cornerstone of what you guys do. Maybe if we, we have time for one, one more, more question. Yeah, sure. If, if anyone has. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. Avery. Um, what exactly? Uh, with the last question. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I was mentioning just a few minutes ago all of the different properties that, that Google kind of participates in, right? Google Maps, YouTube, things like that. Um, for other than paying you know, an internet service provider to uh, have internet access in your, in your home or on your phone, most of those sites that you use and most of that technology technology that you use, Google search, you go search for results, you get information back. All of that stuff is free, right? You don't pay for the search results. You don't pay to watch YouTube videos. You don't pay for Google Maps results to go find a local restaurant. All of that stuff is given to you for free. What Google does to monetize that and actually make money so we can give you all of those cool things for free, and this happens all across the internet, all of these sites that you go to for free to read news or watch sports highlights, those are all free for you. What they do to monetize that is, is have advertising on their sites. So what I do is I help advertisers find intelligent ways to strategize and, and monetize their advertisements on some of these sites so that we can make a little bit of money off those advertisements so that we can then give you those things for free. A great example is you go watch a YouTube video. You might have to watch a small five se second clip of an advertisement, almost like a commercial before you can watch that content. Um, hopefully it's a really relevant ad that might be interesting to you, but once you watch that, then you can have that free content. So we help advertisers 
uh, advertise essentially on the internet like they might do in a magazine or a newspaper, but just in the world of the internet. Really good question, though. Thank you. Yeah. How about a big round of applause? Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me in. I really appreciate it. Yeah. If you guys are interested, I did wear my national championship ring, too. Um, I wear it like maybe once or twice a year. Yeah. Uh, I don't wear it too often. So if you guys want to come take a quick look at that, yeah. too, it's kind of fun. So uh, If we have time, then maybe some pictures if you have oh, time. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. I'm in no hurry. So. Thank you. Thank so, uh, wow, what a, what a presentation. Now it's our job to go back to our classrooms, our extracurricular activities, and even to our neighborhoods and communities to take these lessons with us to be the best that we can be. My favorite takeaways, power of preparation and that Google mindset. Don't be afraid to fail, just go for it. So go have a great day and uh, we'll tell you about our February sessions later in the month.